Hey guys, welcome to the Found Records podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Bill, and this is episode two of the Found Records. The Found Records I created to recorrect history at a time where a lot of media, groups, organizations, uh, films, they're all kind of fan fictionalizing history for clickbait, for uh, higher watch times, for controversy. There's a lot of reasons why we're finding history being rewritten almost. And although, sure, it might get them that quick buck, that quick click that they need, um, it is damaging because now people are parroting these lies about history and it is changing our understanding of our own history. And any historian will tell you this, any philosopher will tell you this, the most dangerous thing that can be done to you as a society is to give you incorrect information about who you are and where you come from. Um, History allows us to learn patterns, allows us to grow, allows us to learn lessons. And when you make history more palatable for whatever ulterior motive, you remove that growth. And so um, in this episode, ep- actually episode one is about Marilyn Monroe. If you haven't tuned in yet and you love Marilyn Monroe. I do talk about uh, Marilyn and all of the lies surrounding her. I mean, her entire life has been fictionalized so aggressively that she has been erased, literally erased. There's nothing left of her in a lot of biopics that are made about her. So the Found Records episode one is focused on correcting all of these lies centered around Marilyn Monroe. And I didn't even cover them all, but I definitely covered um, a lot of the major points that are constantly being parroted around by people. Now we're on to episode two. And in episode two, we're going to be talking about Betty Boop. Now I was going to make this a a later episode. Um, I, I wanted to bring in more fresh points because I have spoken about Betty Boop a couple of times. But... I'm still fleshing out my thoughts and making sure that they're organized and triple checking my facts. And so I figured why not do an episode that I know I can ace and that is the history of Betty Boop. So we're going to bump that topic up to episode two. Now, Betty Boop, um, if you guys don't know, if you guys don't recognize me on my, from my main page, Jay Bunzi, um, I'm known for cosplaying Betty Boop the most. I've done a lot of cosplays, but Betty Boop was my most popular one. I, th- I don't even know how many million of views it got. I think like 40, 48 million or something crazy like that. But it is my most popular video and it is my cosplay that went the most viral. And it went viral internationally across multiple news stations. It even reached Japan. So Betty Boop is a character that I owe personally a lot of my success too. Um, and I'm super honored that to this day, I find people referencing my Betty Boop cosplay when they cosplay Betty Boop. I think that is absolutely the biggest honor ever. She's one of the characters that I grew up on and adored next to characters like Jessica Rabbit. And um, <clears throat> to know that like people see my cosplay as the standard for that character is like the biggest compliment in the universe. So I hold Betty Boot very closely, especially with a lot of respect, and I owe a lot to her. Um, Because I'm so interested in the character and I grew up loving this character, I know a lot about her history. Um, Aside from being like a self-proclaimed historian, I'm just very well-versed on her creation as well as other characters that I adore, like Ariel the Little Mermaid. And so um, when I first posted that Betty Boop cosplay, it did very well. But when I reposted it a few years later, and I'm talking many years later because the video is pretty old, it got mixed reactions. Um, And that was my introduction to the conspiracy theory on Betty Boop. I'd never heard of it until... I reposted my Betty Boop cosplay and the reactions went from 100% positive. And I'm, I'm not even exaggerating, literally 100% positive to kind of a mixed bag. Um, if anything, it's like 60% um, controversial comments. And the number one comment I often got when I reposted the Betty Boop content was, you can't cosplay Betty Boop. And I was like, what is happening? 
what's going on? Did I miss something? And comments started pouring in more and more. You're white. You can't be Betty Boop. Betty Boop is originally black. Um, that's a black character. You don't get to cosplay that black character. And I was like, I thought I was on an episode of Pranked. I was like, what, what's happening? Like I was just at Universal two weeks ago. I promise when you walk to Universal, she's a white character. Like I, I was, I was absolutely confused. And I started going down the rabbit hole of like, why is everybody saying this? And that led me back to PBS. PBS, an article. And the article read, Betty Boop was originally black. And because of that, a lot of people took it as a, this is our character now, you don't have the right to cosplay. Now, I want to go on a little bit of a tangent. Um, a lot of black cosplayers and amazing ones at that get a lot of comments saying oh well that's a japanese character like they will do like sailor moon you can't cosplay that you're black it's a horrific comment and i see it from time to time and it's wild that we all haven't caught on to the memo that that is not how cosplay works but also cosplay is for everyone pbs came out with an article saying that the first illustration of betty boop was drawn african-american and that she was based off of Esther Jones, a cotton club jazz singer is what they would call her. Uh, a, and she was known for scatting. And that Esther Jones was the voice and the physique and the style behind Betty Boop. And that Betty Boop's first episode, she was drawn black and then changed and whitewashed to white. So that's basically what PBS, um, that, that PBS started as a, as a rumor. And that rumor spread like wildfire because Betty Boop is very, very loved in the black community. Um, she's a very popular character in the black community, um, as well as the, the Latin community, which is why I love her. Because in Puerto Rico, Betty Boop is plastered everywhere in Puerto Rican attire. Um, so I feel like because it was already such a beloved character, when that rumor dropped, it was just swept away. Um, and people just started, uh, parroting that information. I'm talking like YouTube videos, TikTok videos, Instagram videos, breaking news, you know? And, um, I feel like people were just so excited at this idea of Betty Boop not being white that nobody stopped and went, hold on, let me fact check this, or let me see if this all adds up. So that's what I'm going to do in this video or in this episode. I keep saying video. It's technically a podcast episode in this audio. That's weird. <laughs> Anyways, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you where that rumor comes from, where it's not true and where it is kind of true. There is a little truth to this, actually. This is what's interesting. Um, and I'm going to break it down as simple as I can. Um... Now, I do want to start off and lead with the fact that Max Fletcher Studios, which is the creator of Betty Boop, did come out with a counter article. And in that counter article on their website, they have stated that PBS's article, they actually wrote that PBS's article was false on their Instagram. But in the article, it was a correction article of how Betty Boop was created. It was very loose, and I feel like they even didn't cover the full story, but they were pretty much saying that no, Betty Boop is not based off of a singular black woman. Um, this is actually how she was created. So let's go down to the lane of how was Betty Boop even created? Let's start from the very, very beginning because um, that is the only way we can get our ducks in a row. So Betty Boop was created by an artist named Max Fletcher and he wanted to compete with Mickey Mouse. So she was supposed to be a poodle. Because Mickey's a mouse, Betty Boop's a poodle. That was like kind of the, the thought process. So in, what was it, August 1930? Let me make sure that is correct because dates, yep, August 1930, August 9th specifically, um, she debuted in an episode called Dizzy Dishes. So this was the first episode ever. So she's this really terrifying poodle looking thing. Now, people weren't so crazy about the poodle version of Betty Boop. People really didn't react. They were kind of like, okay, like, what is this? And 
Max Fletcher was very disappointed. So he went back to the drawing board and a year later, he was thinking, you know what? I think Betty Boop is supposed to be a human. So he took the poodle ears and swapped the ears for hoop earrings. And he's like, I'm just gonna make a 1920s flapper girl and that'll be Betty Boop. So in 1932, he came out with a short called Annie Rags. And that's, you know, she looks exactly like she does all the time, like since we've known her. Um, she was white or white appearing in that episode and people were really receptive. So then the next year after that in 33, um, he started kind of crossing Betty Boop with already popular existing characters like Popeye. So in that episode, uh, I think that was also a short, um, Popeye and Betty Boop were seen together and Betty Boop is featured with Hawaiian cultural attire and she has a tan. Now, this representation of Betty Boop, of her being in Hawaii on vacation, is where PBS took that clip and ran left field with it. So they took that clip, they darkened even more the tan, you know, they just changed the lighting or whatever in editing. Like this is what Betty Boop originally looked like. Um, so that is where the lie began. You know, Betty Boop continued gaining popularity. Um, and that is when, she, you know, we went back to the pale Betty Boop. She got a lot of shorts. The shorts became full, longer episodes and she racked up popularity like no other. She was so popular, in fact, that she was giving Walt Disney a run for his money. Uh, and Betty Boop was just, I mean, the, the thing is, is that Betty Boop came at the most perfect time in history because we just got done with the flapper era. So she has like a little bit of nostalgia to her. That's like the equivalence of like, um, I don't know if that's the best equivalence because this was a 10 year difference, but I feel like for us, maybe a 30 year difference would be better. But that's like if somebody came out with like a 90s themed character now for us, like that would excite us because that was such a great time for a lot of us. Um, and so the flapper era, at least stylistically, it was a fun time. Partying was a big common theme. And during the 30s, when war started being prevalent and being, you know, it was a more of a depressing time, having a character that reminded you of your more happier times was comforting. And that's what Betty Boop was to society. And Max Fletcher was absolutely brilliant with creating a character that subconsciously reminded society of a happier time in their own life. And so <clears throat> Betty Boop was just, she was a hot thing. Now, uh, PBS reported uh, that Betty Boop uh, was then whitewashed. And we've already discussed how that wasn't true. And that there was a lawsuit that revealed that Esther Jones, which was a singer, was the original uh, idea of Betty Boop. Visually, vocally, the whole nine yards, a photocopy representation of the character. And they were wrong. They, were, they did come out with an article later apologizing to Fletcher Studios for misreporting Betty Boop's history. Um, but there is some truth to it as well. But let me, let me explain where the truth is and where the, where the lie is in Betty Boop coming from a black singer. So at the time that Betty Boop was very, very popular, it was just, she was everywhere. Um, there was a singer named Helen Kane that noticed something interesting about Betty Boop. And it was that Betty Boop looks just like her and sounds just like her and behaves just like her. And she's like, oh my God, there's a studio that has come out with a character that is me and they're making money and I'm not getting a cent of it. So she goes and files a lawsuit. Now, Max Fletcher Studios, and I believe for legal reasons, denies that there is any influence of Helen Kane and Betty Boop. And that was the basis of the lawsuit. The count, you know, the counter argument from the studio was, no, this is just an average flapper girl and she's based off of multiple famous actresses and 
you're not the only one that's like that. So go away. <laughs> that's like the millennial take on, on how that conversation <laughs> happened. Um, <clears throat> uh, but essentially they were, they were saying like, no, like she's a generic flapper girl. Like, how could you say this is about you? Now, let me interject here with my opinion, <laughs> but, but fact-based opinion. I have personally noticed in my research that Helen Kane wasn't all that crazy. And I feel like she was gaslit because when I sat and watched all of Betty Boop's shorts, and then I watched a lot of Helen Kane's work, they're the same thing. For example, Betty Boop also sang the song Nan McGrew, which was performed by Helen Kane. Helen Kane performed it first, and Betty Boop was showing up later in a short, singing the same song, wearing the same outfit as Helen Kane, and there was like slight lyric changes. I Want to Be Loved by You is another one that Helen Kane sung, and Betty Boop also sung. Uh, there was specifically, I remember a, there was an episode of Betty Boop at a club, and she was wearing a dress with a big bow in the back. And Helen Kane also wore a a dress with a big bow in the back. And so, personally, in my opinion, I think they gaslit her because they knew that they didn't want to lose ownership of Betty Boop or have to seize production. So they had to dig deep to see how they can avoid her winning. So there's actually um, an article that came out at the time And it's a photo of Helen Kane on one end and three other actresses on the other end, um, which included Mae Questel, Margie Hines, and Bonnie Poe, um, who, you know, they do look very similar to Helen Kane as well. And they kind of behave the same and pose the same. Um, Again, personally, I, I found way too many similarities with the music and the clothing to Helen Kane, but you know, I'm going to leave my thought out of it because I cannot prove it, obviously, other than showing you the fact that there's a lot, (laughs) way too many similarities. But aside from that, um, Max Fletcher's defense was, no, she's based off of these actresses, including Clara Bow as well. So again, it's Bonnie Poe, Margie Hines, Mae Questel, which ended up being the voice of Betty Boop, and Clara Bow being his biggest inspiration. And she's like, well, what about my catchphrase? Boop, boop, ba-doop. That's mine. Like, no one else does that. This is what Helen Kane says. So Max Fletcher had to dig deeper. Who else has done the catchphrase, boop, boop, ba-doop? A nine-year-old. A nine-year-old performer. Well, technically, by the time of this lawsuit, she might have been 11, maybe 13. But she was a kid. When Betty Boop first came out, Esther Jones was nine years old. When the lawsuit happened, if I'm not mistaken, I think she was in her preteen age. And he found that she was singing Boop Boop Badoop, like to the T. And he started asking around. He's like, you know, how long has she been performing here? And, you know... She was popular in her own community. Esther Jones was very popular in her own community. Um, She was a local favorite performer. Uh, She was often performing in a beret. So she she was so freaking cute. She wore this like little uh, leotard. Um, I mean, the picture is in black and white, but I think it was maybe like a white or a pink color. And then like this little side beret. And that was like her go-to look. And she would dance at the same time that she would sing. Scatting is where the idea of boop, boop, boop actually even comes from. Scatting is, is, it derived from black culture. Um, So African-Americans made very, uh, made jazz and scatting very popular in America. And they brought it over into cinema and white people started partaking in jazz music and scatting. So Helen Kane's not original at all. And Helen Kane lost the lawsuit because of that. So that is the real story of how uh, Betty Boop was created. 
Um, and at this time as well, acting like a baby was very common. It's kind of odd. This kind of sort of stems from like the Shirley Temple vibe that people think that children being cute. We kind of still have this problem actually. If you look at like the gamer community, like the kawaii type of acting. <laughs> Oh, I can't believe I just said that. Um, is still being like kind of fetishized. So like I feel like it kind of gave women this like baby fawn type of um, energy, like helpless, like help me, I'm so soft and feminine and weak, and like people got off on that. It's it's really weird. Anyways, nonetheless, in the 30s and also in the 20s, acting like a child was definitely very common. Uh, with women and men loved it and people still do it to this day so anyways um you know max fletcher did win the lawsuit and helen kane lost um because technically her baby type acting and singing was already popular amongst multiple women in hollywood because that was the trend and then the one thing she had to hold on to which was the catchphrase wasn't even her catchphrase. It was Esther Jones' catchphrase. So she's more of a compilation of other people. And so the court was like, I'm sorry, but you lose. Because of that, we can't say that Betty Boop was black. There wasn't a time in which Max Fletcher intentionally created Betty Boop to be a black woman. Um, there's no evidence in her timeline of this. But what there is evidence of is that because she's singing jazz music, even though white women also sang jazz music, the origins of jazz music comes from African Americans. And so that is where the credit lies. Betty Boop actually, and this is something Max Fletcher says, you know, the Max Fletcher Studios wrote in their article is that Betty Boop is a compilation of women, period. Just multiple women, the culture of the time, uh, the 1920s being big on jazz music, being big on the flapper girl look. Um, she is a compilation of women, period. Um, and I think that's beautiful because that means like we can all cosplay Betty Boop and feel like she is a part of all of us. And I really wish that that was the angle that PBS went with. Um, and I'm glad that Max Fletcher Studios did end up making an article to kind of double down on that and explain um, that she is within all of us because that just means that we can all celebrate her and love her and cosplay her comfortably. And for me, I personally love seeing, I've seen so many different Betty Boop cosplayers. It's beautiful. Like I get emotional because like they just, they, they're feeling themselves. They're, they're, they're happy. I mean, when I wore Betty Boop, I was feeling myself. I felt beautiful and so to see other women feel beautiful and confident in the Betty Boop look, I think it's just magical. And that's the beauty of cosplay. Like cosplay really is what gave me so much confidence in myself. And I imagine in a lot of other women. So keep cosplaying Betty Boop. Keep giving her love. I don't ever want her popularity to die out. I think she's such an icon. Um, and I look forward to maybe someday a Betty Boop live action movie like how how awesome would that be actually there's a Betty Boop musical and right now the actress who is Betty Boop in the musical is a black actress and she does really well um it she looks awesome and she kind of like looks like her too like she's got the big eyes and stuff so check that out um I look forward to a live action film I really hope that we don't have a race war over it um I think anyone can if you can embody her you, then you can be Betty Boop, you know what I mean? So um, I really hope that we can continue in the cosplay community, but also in the Betty Boop fan base, continue making it a safe space for women to celebrate this icon that honestly set the pace for a lot of us. <laughs>